You know, you hear a lot about law enforcement around the country and, uh, you know, especially in the last uh, three years, um, there's been a lot of changes in legislation, people getting involved. You know, we have everything from defund the police to reimagine the police to let's have the police don't do no traffic stops, all kinds of different things. And and uh, so I wanted to talk to someone um, who is so knowledgeable about so many of those issues. And she comes from an organization that has really been advocating for their state's law enforcement um, almost since I was a baby. So, wow, that's been a long time. Teresa Taylor, welcome to the program. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here. So you work for uh, WACOPS. Tell everybody um, what that stands for. WACOPS is the Washington Council of Police and Sheriffs. We are a trade association. We are the the largest uh, organization of our kind in the state of Washington, and our purpose is to advocate for the profession of law enforcement. And, you know, again, you guys have been around since 1962, and I think one of the um, one of the things that's unique about your uh, association is you have chiefs, sheriffs, you have officers, deputies, um, you know, you really cover the whole gambit of the profession and you get involved in so many different things from legislative uh, sessions to um, scholarships and uh, and you you guys really do it all, don't you? We try to do it all. Uh, we're a small office. So I always say, you know, we're a big company with a small office. Uh, you know, we are an organization of organizations. So folks often think that we're a union. Uh, we are not a union. We are a trade association, a nonprofit. But our membership are all union members. So our organization was built on a labor model. We believe in the importance of having labor protections for law enforcement in the state of Washington. And to be a member of WACOPS, you must be a member of your local bargaining unit. And that bargaining unit then joins WACOPS. And as a result of that, we represent over 5,000 boots on the ground officers in the state of Washington. And you're correct. We do also have uh, many levels of management that have chosen to be members of our organization as well. And I think that's really important because when you have a leadership involved, in an association like yours, um, then, you know, there's there's just such a broader perspective um, for everyone in the organization. And, you know, it, especially in the last three years, but, but even uh, long before um, uh, 2020, police unions got kind of a bad rap, didn't they? The, there was always this, there's always this um, narrative that uh, police unions, and I was a, a member of a police union when I was a police officer, um, that all we do is try and save bad cops jobs and nothing could be further from the truth, right? Correct. Uh, you know, I have, we hear that and we still hear that, um, especially in Washington where there's all of this turmoil around the relationships between law enforcement and um, members of the public, particularly members of the public that feel marginalized, uh, there's always this idea that uh, if all, if not for the unions, right? Um, but the fact is, you know, WACOPS, as an example, our board is entirely made up of fully commissioned officers. They're elected by their fellow officers from across the state. And I have never heard a member Two things. I've never heard one of my members say um, they we, we cannot have any more reform. Um, officers are very open to uh, new ways of doing things. They're probably the most adaptable, trainable group of professionals in any career. I'd stand them up against any profession in terms of their willingness to always be evolving to meet the needs of their community. And I've never heard a member say, oh, we need to keep bad cops on the job. You know, the last thing a good cop wants is to have to work with a bad cop. Uh, our process here in the state of Washington is very stringent to be hired to begin with. That doesn't mean that there aren't people that ultimately, you know, don't fit well in the profession. But um, unions are not there to keep bad cops working. In fact, bad cops make it that much harder for unions to do the good work that they're there to do. 
And you're absolutely right. And and in a state like Washington, um, you know, you guys have been dealing with, um, I don't even know how to put it, you know, this kind of a war on cops, um, not just, you know, physically, um, but also just attacks on the profession for a long, long time, haven't you? You've got you know, you have a very diverse state, you have um, extremely uh, urban areas like Seattle, and then you have mountainous rural areas, um, you know, Spokane and Spokane Valley um, is practically Idaho. And, uh, um, you know, it's just the diversity in Washington is fascinating. And I encourage anyone, if you've never visited Washington State, it makes a great vacation place. Um but the diversity of your law enforcement personnel is just as diverse as your citizens that you serve, isn't it? I would make that argument. You know, um, one of the struggles we have here in Washington is that we have a legislature that is predominantly of one party. And um, and in this case, it happens to be Democrat controlled. But the reality is that it doesn't matter, in my view, which party is in control. When you have a party that controls all aspects of your of your legislative as well as your executive branch, you lose any ability to create balance and tension in any kind of debate. And so in Washington, having a single party in total control of all aspects of the process we are faced with a difficult time trying to get alternative viewpoints to be considered in the debate. And so even though we do have this geographically tremendously diverse state, we have all sorts of viewpoints and beliefs across our state, um, from rural to urban, from you know suburban, and from the oceans to the mountains. I and mean, we have all these different kinds of lifestyles. And yet, um, a lot of that's not being considered in our policy debates because we have it really being completely monopolized by a single viewpoint. And that's really made it tremendously challenging on the issues related to officer safety and public safety. When you talk about labor rights, um, we have a legislature that's been very supportive of maintaining and in fact enhancing the labor rights of law enforcement. So we have this strange um, balance going on between these two very important issues, issues that we focus on here at Walk Ops. So when we talk about some of the legislative issues that you guys get involved in, you know, famously since the death of George Floyd, there were some pretty sweeping changes um, that came down in a lot of states and Washington was one of them. What is Walk Ops prioritizing when it comes to legislation right now? Well, we high priority for us is anything that would address, alter, uh, in any way impact the job, um, the job of law enforcement. So when you talk about all those pieces of legislation, 2021 was a watershed session for Washington State as it relates to law enforcement and law enforcement reform. It included the prohibition of most pursuits of um, potential suspects. It also included the prohibition of several different types of equipment, all sort of listed as having been military. Uh, it included a revamping of our Criminal Justice Training Commission, which is a centralized model. It's not, it's fairly unique to Washington. It's not the most common way that officers are trained, but we have a centralized training and certifying body that body also can decertify. And there was a lot of work in 21 done around what types of uh, allegations against an officer would warrant a mandatory decertification investigation. Uh, so that's in place. Also in 2021, our state launched a state level Office of Independent Investigation, which is a body that has not yet begun to uh, do investigations, but they will be able to decide in the in the event of an officer involved shooting or other incident which in, inflicted uh, bodily harm or death um, on a member of community, they could decide to step in and become the investigator of that. Um, so those are just some of the, well, and then on top of that, we had a whole change to how use of force could be, when it could be used, 
and um, under what criteria and what counts as a use of force. Um, so we've had a lot of really important fundamental aspects of law enforcement changed in very dramatic ways in a very short amount of time with very little evaluation or study regarding what they wanted to do, what they've since done, and how that has impacted law enforcement's ability to protect the public and themselves. Do you get some good community support around the state when when you try to advocate for, uh, you know, changes? You know, uh, it's an interesting thing with the voting public. Uh, and I want to say this gently, but I guess what I would urge people to remember is that, you know, when you're talking about things that you know, the local barbecue or your neighbor's house, and you're all, you know, commiserating over what you believe is going on, you have to translate that into voting. And uh, in November, we just had an election here. And uh, not only uh, did the Democrat majority uh, retain power, they actually gained seats in our legislature. So while during the election process, we heard a lot from the public, because we actually heard it from candidates, expressing concern about pursuits, for example. Um, and yet the election has come and gone and those legislators have been affirmed in what they did. And even though many of them had promised in exchange for your vote, believe me, I'll go back to the legislature and fix this. Um, we have yet to fix it and uh, we're running out of days. So um, session's gonna end on April 23rd. And as of right now, um, there's no clear path um, to resolving even the pursuit issue in our state. Talk about that pursuit issue, because I don't know if everyone around the country understands that you uh, you guys have arguably um, probably the most restrictive pursuit policy in the nation. Tell people about that. Yeah, well. I, you know better than I do sort of what happens nationwide, but I can tell you here in the state of Washington that under our current law, the law that was adopted two years ago, an officer must have probable cause that a crime is being or has been committed by someone in the vehicle in order to pursue them should they fail to yield when an officer is indicated um, a desire for them to pull over. Um, and so if they take off, uh, unless that officer is further along in their investigation, right? And oftentimes this is the beginning of the investigation. You don't necessarily have probable cause. You have reasonable suspicion. Uh, but in our state, you have to have probable cause with some exceptions. Under the current law, certain violent offenses um, you can pursue uh, for whether or not you have probable cause or not, if you have reasonable suspicion. So it has made it um, basically in our state uh, for the most common things that people think about or are affected by. If you um, want to steal from an establishment, all you have to do is get in a vehicle and get away. If you can get in a vehicle, then you're you're probably free, you know, free and clear. Uh, because theft um, or uh, that sort of theft is not pursuable. Um, so just get in the car and go. Uh, and that's really disappointing. It's really impacted our real, our real, our, our retailers um, because we have organized theft. They'll pull in with multiple cars. They'll go in and swarm the place, steal things, get in cars and take off. Um, but even just regular, you know, one-offs where you have people walking into a store and stealing product and getting into a car. And the interesting thing is oftentimes these cars are being uh, driven, but the car itself is stolen because you can't pursue for a stolen vehicle either. So car theft in our state has gone through the roof. Uh, you know, any one of us may have in our adult life known somebody who knew somebody who had their car stolen. Now it is very common uh, that people know someone, or I know two people, personally, who've had their car stolen. Um, and I, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm unique. So I think that's just an example of how significantly these law changes have emboldened a certain faction of our community to not only now steal cars, but to use the stolen car in their theft ring because neither the theft nor the stolen car weren't being pursued. And there have been some really drastic 
consequences to that law, hasn't there? There have been um, really tragic deaths as a result of it. Uh, we had a terrible situation in eastern Washington, so over the Cascade Mountains, uh, in which a driver was driving at a high rate of speed. Uh, there was not probable cause to stop for speed. Uh, and as and later on down the road, uh, this driver ended up slamming into a vehicle and killing two children in that car. Um, on another sort of um, sort of unexpected, I guess, uh, connection, we had a landscaping company that had, had vehicles stolen, equipment stolen. One of the things that it was stolen from them after several of these thefts having occurred was a vehicle. That vehicle um, was uh, then involved later um, in running over two young girls, killing one of them, um, and had law enforcement been able to have apprehended that vehicle, that tragedy couldn't have happened. But unfortunately, they couldn't stop the vehicle. Um, and so later, not immediately, but later, that same vehicle was used in this terrible hit and run. So, and those are just a couple of examples. There are, there are many examples. And then there's just the tragedy of, uh, you know, a person, a worker, a person who's trying to live their life goes out to get in their vehicle to go to work and their vehicle's gone. You know, this is not, in our state, and our legislature has affirmed this and reaffirmed this, this is not important to them. But I'll tell you, if that's your vehicle and that's your means of getting to work, it's important to you. And not everybody has access to public transit. Our state is not, um, even for our density, you know, really Seattle's about the only place where you can have regular consistent access to public transit. Um, it's not readily available in many, many, many communities, most communities. So imagine you're a worker whose boss expects to see you at 8 a.m. and you've got a 30 minute commute and you step out of your house in just enough time to get in your car and drive on the road and you don't have a way to get to work. Um, these are genuine tragedies for families, let alone the cost of replacing that vehicle, if it can even be replaced um, on the family's budget. So, I mean, we've had certainly terrible tragedies in the loss of life, but we've also had enormous hardship for people who have gone out to find their mode of transportation has been um, removed from their property. And that's the thing. So many of these laws, like the pursuit law, um, are enacted, are passed by legislators who only think about one side of the issue. They really don't think about, um, you know, a, a, a single mom in Spokane Valley who needs to take her kids to school and then get to her waitress job so that she can continue to feed those kids. Um, the, you know, they just think about, oh, the, you know, the police are bad. And we don't want them to be able to pull people over. Um, and uh, why do they need to pull people over anyway? Because they're just going to give them a ticket for no license plate or whatever. Um, they don't necessarily always think things through. And, and that kind of goes back to what you were talking about. When you don't have this diversity of a legislators, um, you tend to get a very one-sided view, don't you? Right. I mean, we all should be careful all the time to to not just speak in an echo chamber. You know, I I like to talk to people who have different viewpoints than I do. Um, I want to check myself. I want to know. I, as an organization, Walk Hops is very open to, we reach out to um, all of the different community organizations that have an interest in this topic. Uh, we're not afraid of making you know, sort of surprising um, alignments with other groups. We've proven this over and over again, because we want to make sure that we're able to share with them our perspective from law enforcement, but we want to hear from them because oftentimes you can get differing minds in a room together. You can find that you have more in common and more agreement than you think. But if you aren't willing to have that conversation, it's really easy to just assume we don't agree and we're not going to. We've been able to bridge a lot of challenging conversations with Washington State's various communities by having face-to-face -face conversation. But in 2021, our legislature really discouraged, in fact, did not even allow for folks with any different viewpoint to be heard. They did not want any opposition. They wanted to just ram their ideas through. 
And they were very effective at doing that. You know, it's interesting you were talking about pulling people over for this or for that. This year, Washington State's had a bill and it's at the moment not going anywhere, but it would have banned traffic stops. Uh, and so I'm sure we'll be dealing with that bill again next year. Um, but for this year, I think, uh, of course, it's too soon to say for sure because crazy things can happen with the legislature. They can suspend rules and do all kinds of things if they wanted to. But it sounds like for this year, that bill's not going forward. But it would have done exactly that. It would have made it so that an officer could not stop a vehicle if the primary reason for the stop was some sort of safety-related issue or expired tabs or a variety of, of things. Well, you guys are slowly chipping away, um, you know, which is what has always impressed me about what you do. And you're out, you're out in the community talking, you're out in the media talking and uh, and you're letting people know that you you really don't just work for law enforcement. You represent them, but you're ultimately working to help keep the community safe. And that's what we so appreciate about what Walk Hops is doing. Tell people where they can find you uh, on the on the web and uh, on social media. So we're on Facebook, Washington Council of Police and Sheriffs. We would encourage everybody to, to like us and uh, see what we post there. And then our website is www.walkhops.org. I tell you, Teresa, I can't thank you enough for spending time with us today. This was um, a really enlightening conversation, and we appreciate everything that you do. And if you would like more information about the National Police Association, visit us at nationalpolice.org. Last year, law enforcement officers were involved in hundreds of thousands of use of force incidents. A use of force incident is when an officer must use nonverbal tactics to gain control of a dangerous situation. Put the knife on the ground. In many cases, officers have no choice but to use force when a suspect doesn't comply with a lawful order. Use of force is always ugly. No one likes it, especially police officers. Together, we can help de-escalate these dangerous encounters. Help police officers by complying with their lawful orders. Don't attack, attempt to disarm, or flee from an officer. Use of force is an officer's last option. Most incidents can be avoided by not resisting arrest. If you feel you've been wrongfully detained by a police officer, then seek a legal solution after the encounter has been resolved. Let's keep everyone safe. Comply now and complain later.